It had been one full month since Baron had knocked on Joyra's door and asked her to take over looking after Karn. Joyra agreed, but she found that between taking care of Karn and the mounting stress from all of her schoolwork, that she was in need of a break. So tonight, she would escape the Talarian Academy. Now this was no small feat. So. She waited till nightfall. When you're dealing with a secretive magical school that exists on an island that is magically shrouded from the world, you tend to need to take extra steps to deal with security. So she waited until nightfall and until the night birds were singing. She, she shivered in the night's air. Uh, the day had been hot and dry. It was a welcome contrast. She tried to control her breathing. This close to the wall, the guards might hear her, so she slowly crept forwards, doing everything she could to not get caught. Now, how did she get to this point? Well, Joyra had studied the plans for the Talarian Academy and found an unused duct, which was originally supposed to be used for waste removal. Originally, the idea behind the building was it was supposed to be a dormitory as opposed to the laboratory that it ended up being. So she found this tunnel and it served as her own private entrance and exit to the Talarian Academy. She created a way of keeping the passage secure against others using it. She felt responsible not to endanger anyone else as at this academy, Master Mazra, the crazy mad mage of Talaria, dealt with any sort of intruders harshly and seemed to come across as almost paranoid, but Joyra couldn't tell if his paranoia was genuine or if there was actually a, like a real threat to the island. So she wanted to make sure that even though she was being self-indulgent by going out of the school, she wasn't leaving it unsecured for other individuals to come in. Now she was flush with excitement at the, this point because she was ready to meet her mystery man the man she had rescued previously on the beach. So basically to get there, she had to deal first with the guards, human and inhuman. Being the clever artificer that she was, Joyra found that the magical constructs that were in her way were far easier to deal with. The real problem tended to be the human guards as they were less predictable. So she had a trick that she used. Essentially, she fashioned tiny little tiny little birds that are made out of paper with some feathers stuck into them and they're attracted to sweat so she flung these up into the air to activate them and send them off to harry the guards and she thought to herself about how amazing the last few months had been this was not the first night that she had slipped out like this this had become a welcome routine for her if infrequent due to the the danger of being caught outside of the school if master malzra was to find out about her mystery man carrick then that would be the end of carrick malzra would have him destroyed she broke one of the cardinal rules of the talarian academy when she rescued carrick from a shipwreck and hid him away in her secret little hideaway so she held her breath waiting as her little clockwork birds started to distract the guards. Now, these birds were originally designed by Tano. She found the designs for them in some really old manuscripts in the school. There were some real advantages to Joyra being such an active and observant student, right? She would dive into all sorts of things. So this was originally designed by Tano's. They were loud and fast and attracted to sweat. They're not really like an offensive sort of thing. It's more just like an alarm system or an annoyance, depending on the scenario. In this case, they were clearly used to annoy the guards. Now, the guards started swinging their weapons around, trying to knock them out of the sky, swearing and grumbling over the fact that this is this is unacceptable. They were threatening to quit their job over this. Joy was actually giggling to herself, listening to all this going on as the guards grumbled about how the whole school had had a rule put over it where students were no longer allowed to create them. These these would be like the equivalent of paper airplanes at the regular schools. Or if you took your pen and made it into like a little, oh, I'm gonna pea shooter sort of like little wads of chewed up paper. Did you guys do that? 
Do you, I, how old am I? Am I talking about, is this the point where I'm basically like talking about taking a hoop down the sidewalk with a stick or playing kick the can? I, uh, you know what, let's not diverge from the story too much here down ridiculous lane. So back to the, the constructs. These birds are harrying the guards. The guards are swatting at them, trying to knock them out of the sky. They smash the birds and yell their victory into the night. Now under, the, under all of this noise happening, that's when Joyra sneaks up and opens the latch and is able to slide the gate open quietly and slide outside of the school. She did find it funny the sense of accomplishment that adults could get from just smashing up a tiny little meaningless bird. She thought about that as she slipped off into the forest around the academy. There's a, a thick forest nearby and found the path that she knew so well, leading to the rocky niche where Carrick awaited her. It took her a full hour, a full hour's walk from the Tlairn Academy to reach her safe haven. As she approached, she smelled spiced rabbit being roasted over a fire. One of the advantages of this whole setup was that Carrick was quite an accomplished hunter. So he had fashioned himself some very, very crude hunting tools, and it resulted in him catching live game on the island of Teleria. And he knew enough about spices and cooking to actually come up with some really amazing food. Now, in comparison to the very bland fare that was served at the school, because Melzra believed, you know what, give them nourishing food that's good for them, but nothing interesting, keep them focused on their study. So this was a very welcome divergence. The entire process of going to this hideaway is a very sensory experience, right? Remember it, that in the previous videos we talked about this, Joyra is in like the full blossom of her youth. She is 18 years old at this point and has never been in any sort of real like get together with anybody before in terms of like the hookup, right? So Carrick is her first, and this whole thing is very romanticized. I mean, ima imagine that scenario. Imagine if you had a secret hideaway where you could have the person you cared about most waiting for you there, and then when you escaped, it was like camping, and there was delicious food, and just you and them alone. Like, that is a very inviting and appealing scenario. So she, as she, as she approaches closer, she scents this rabbit and basically starts to speed up. At this point, you're almost home. You're happy to be where you're going. So she's going really quickly in there, finds Carrick. He's in front of the fire, close to this roughshod makeshift bookcase that he had that was bulging with books. If you're wondering where the books came from, that is because Joyra would take these books on loan from the Tolarian Academy and bring them out here for Carrick. She loved to surprise him with new books because he was a voracious reader. It was to the point where all of the borrowed tomes that he had were essentially straining the bookcase that he made. It, it creaked and threatened to break at any moment. In fact, as she approached the fire, she found him there reading another one of the books. He is constantly, constantly talking about what's going on at the Tolarian Academy with her. Now, obviously, again, this is another violation of the rules, but, you know, in for a penny, in for a pound sort of scenario. When you, when you have your own little stowaway in your secret hideout, bringing him books feels like a, a very minor thing in comparison. But if you remember, again, from previous episodes, Carrick isn't exactly what he seems to be. So, Joyra is, is making some choices that may not turn out to be the best thing. So, he looked up from the book and smiled at her, and at that moment for her, nothing felt finer in the entire multiverse. She complained about Teferi, she complained about the Academy, she complained about Karn, and then she complained about Teferi some more. And Carrick... Carrick basically calls her out and says, it seems, it seems like with the amount of time you spend talking about him and whatever, uh, Teferi, he, he's probably your friend. She's like, no, 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 Karn. Karn is my friend. In fact, you should, you should worry about Karn because he's stronger, taller, younger than you. And Carrick at that point, his eyes flashed with jealousy. He was not happy with what's going on. But she's so into Carrick at this point that Joyra couldn't, she couldn't wait. She has a laugh, but quickly explained, no worries. Karn is just a machine and Karn may have a crush on her. She's not sure about that, but she doesn't really care for Karn, but she definitely does 
enjoy seeing Carrick jealous. She likes feeling like she is important to him. And so Carrick says, look, if you really want me to be jealous, bring me the blueprints of Karn for me to obsess over. So Joyra says that she will do so. And they nestle down into bed together. But she's awoken suddenly to the sound of a struggle. A loud metallic clang followed quickly by other loud metallic clangs and the sound of something shattering. She looked around the cave that she shared with Carrick, but he was nowhere to be seen. He must be where the noise is. With panic growing in her heart, some unknown intruder had found them. Was this one of Malzra's guards? What's going on? She reached the mouth of the cave and recoiled in horror as a massive figure strode towards the cave entrance. There was no sign of Carrick, and Joyra figured maybe the sounds were the sounds of Carrick's tools being broken upon maybe the armor of Urza's guards. So she felt anger and fear rising in her, and she did not intend to be taken easily. Maybe Carrick was only wounded and needed her help. So she used a torch and coal powder, which was a trick that was actually taught at the academy to set the intruder on fire. Alarmingly, the intruder still on fire kept coming towards her, unfazed, and lunged towards her, both arms, both of his arms, coated in flames, reaching towards her. And the flames illuminated the cave because at this point it was dark. They had no light really going on. So the cave was dark. It's lit up by this flaming figure and Joyra is able to make out the form of Karn. So she calls out his name in a mixture of relief and concern. How had he found us? How had he found us here? She felt betrayed, but Karn insisted it was happenstance, but at the same time offered no explanation as to why he was there. Joyra hurriedly gathered her stowed medical supplies and brushed past Karn to find Carrick. So at this point, she crouches down and she is tending to Carrick. Karn comes over. He's, he's very, very apologetic. He looks at this point like a beaten dog. He's so miserable as Joyra is Karn's, essentially at this point, Karn's only friend. So Karn offers, you know what, let me, let me pick Carrick up. But Joy returns to him, yeah, you've done enough. Joyra's too protective. She won't let Karn carry him. Now, as we've talked about before, Joyra is of the Gitu, and that makes her abnormally strong for a human being. So she's able to pick Carrick up and take him back into the cave while Karn trails after her like a sad puppy, while still not offering any explanation about why he's here. Karn actually demands from Joyra, why is, who is this? What are you doing here with this man? What's going on? Does does Malzra know about this? Now, Joyra, this kind of got her back up, right? She was frustrated by the whole scenario, but she knew that at this point, like there's there's no way she can get away with saying nothing, right? Karn, Karn's not explaining why he's there, but Karn's not being caught in the wrong. Joyra feels like she's betrayed his, or like Joyra feels like her friendship has been betrayed by him 100%. However, she doesn't feel like Karn has done anything that's going to get him in any trouble on the island, and so she realizes that she has to explain about the castaway situation. So she explains the whole situation about how she found him in a shipwreck, how she cares for him, how she understands the edicts on the island and knows that Malzra would destroy would destroy Carrick. Now this ends up upsetting Joyra, right? Going through this, sharing this information is very visibly emotionally distressing to Joyra. So she's clearly getting really upset by what's going on. And she's also railing against Malzra because underneath it all, she doesn't understand why Malzra has the rules that he does on the island. Now we, as people who have more information behind the scenes, we know that Malzra's rules are for good reasons, but she doesn't know, right? She just thinks maybe this is a paranoid man and maybe he's just doing this to keep people apart and this is what's leading to a rift in her friendship with Karn. Karn is her main friend on the island, and here Malzra is destroying that friendship 
with his rules. Now, we can admit as well, this is a very selfish view from her, right? She says she doesn't want to endanger people on the island, but at the same time, she's crafted a path in and out of the building. She's rescued a stowaway. So while it's believable that she cares about other people, she is also acting with youthful self-interest, right? This is not really unsurprising, especially when it comes to young love you will find that people become very unreasonable and don't logic doesn't doesn't take as big a part of it right so joyra ends up railing against malzra and she basically talks about he's he's got he's he's the reason i have to keep secrets from you he's the reason you won't tell me secrets now at this point surprisingly karn's face starts to twist and out of nowhere he just says time travel Joyra says, what? what? Wait, what did you just say? And Karn basically says, look, what's going on is I'm involved in time travel experiments. That's how I ended up here. I value your friendship enough that I don't want there to be any secrets between us. So he explains to her that we're, this, this island is about doing time travel experiments. This was a stunning revelation for Joyra, because at this point all she had done was seen the creation of Karn. She had actually built some of the components of the time machine, but she had no idea that's what was being constructed. And the implication of someone like Malzara being able to remake history to his own liking was something that Joyra wasn't sure she felt comfortable with. Now Karn actually went on and talked about the plans to go back millennia to specific locations. And then Karn got down on his knees and begged Joyra, please continue to be his friend. And this Joyra felt uh, like a, a mixture of like, oh, I'm touched by this, but also she felt pity for Karn. She thought what he was doing was somewhat pitiful. Because remember, this is Karn's only friend. And he, so he's desperate, desperate to maintain it. And I, I'm sure we've all had those moments in our life where somebody has done something that is like heartfelt, but also makes you uncomfortable. You know, it's like, it's, I guess the definition you would call it now is, in some ways, it's cringe, right? But obviously, she truly cared for Karn and could see how distraught he was. She told him that she still trusted him. Karn smiled, but suddenly Karn started to fade away into nothingness. All right, my friends, well, that's where this installment of the story ends. If you like what I'm doing here, these lore videos are a fair bit of work. So if you want to support the channel and get more videos like this, go ahead and jump on my Patreon. It does mean a lot to me. Thank you for coming by, and I will talk to you all very soon.